Now that we've got everything in place, let's complete our solution to the Einstein field equations for the static, spherically symmetric mass to end up with our Schwarzschild solution. But let's recap what we've got so far. We've got the onsatz, the educated guess for the Schwarzschild metric under 1. We've got our corresponding non-zero Christoffel symbols under 2. We've got the vacuum Einstein field equations under 3, and under 4 I'm actually going to erase the formula for the Ricci tensor components and instead put down equation 0 to 2 that we derived in the last video. Recall from our previous video that we found these three Ricci tensor components corresponding to our Schwarzschild onsatz and set those to 0 to satisfy the vacuum Einstein field equations. The equations corresponding to the Ricci tensor components being 0 we labeled as 0 to 2 for the R00 to R22 components respectively. The R33 component turned out to be redundant because it's the same as R22 except without the sine squared phi. Meanwhile, the off-diagonal Ricci tensor components all become identically 0, so I haven't included them here. So let's now start solving the differential equations given by equation 0 to 2. To start, we'll add equation 0 and 1 because you'll notice that these two equations share a bunch of terms with each other. When we do that, here's what we get after cancelling common terms. You'll notice that this term on the left is really just the derivative of the product of a and b. So if this derivative equals 0, then the product of a and b is a constant which I'll call capital K. How do we find capital K? Well, in Schwarzschild geometry, if we're really, really far away from the massive object, then our spacetime geometry should approach that of a flat spacetime, of a spacetime with no gravity. So our Schwarzschild metric should approach a Minkowski metric as the R coordinate approaches infinity. And if we look at our Schwarzschild onsatz, we can see that for our metric to approach a Minkowski metric as R approaches infinity, a and b have to approach 1. So as r approaches infinity, a and b approach 1, which means that the product of a and b, our constant k, must also approach 1. But capital K is a constant in r, so its value should be the same for all values of r, very large, very small, etc. So if we know that k equals 1 as r approaches infinity, we can conclude then that capital K must be 1 to begin with. So a of r times b of r is 1. I'll call this equation 3. Let's now use this fact to solve equation 2. We'll plug a times b equals 1 into equation 2 initially, so we'll get things to simplify to the following. Now since a is just 1 over b from equation 3, that means a prime is just negative b prime over b squared from the chain rule. If we now plug this into our simplified equation 2, here's what we'll get. We'll now multiply both sides by b to end up with the following. We can easily now combine like terms and isolate our b prime or db by dr. When we do that, we end up with this simple ordinary differential equation. We can now solve this ODE by separation of variables. We move the 1 minus b to the db side and the dr to the r side. We then integrate both sides to get the negative of the natural log of 1 minus b. There's a negative out front because the b has a negative sign, so we need to take that out. On the right, we get the natural log of r plus some constant I'll call capital K1. We'll then exponentiate both sides to get 1 over 1 minus b on the left, because when you take the negative inside the natural log, you get a power of negative 1 on your 1 minus b. On the right, you get the exponential of k1, which is another constant that I'll call k2, times the exponential of ln r, which is just r. So if we do some algebra and isolate the b, we get 1 minus 1 over k2 times r. Now 1 over k2 can be another constant, which I'll call r sub s, so I have 1 minus rs over r as the solution for b of r. The reason I've called the constant r sub s is that b must be dimensionless as a component in this metric tensor, so the r sub s should have units of distance, just like the r coordinate in order to give us a dimensionless quantity. Now since a is 1 over b, that means a is just the inverse of all this, so 1 over 1 minus rs over r. We're almost done because now we just have to find the value of this integration constant rs. This is a bit tricky because there's no initial or boundary conditions we can explicitly plug in to get our rs. We have to use some principles of physics, particularly the limit of classical physics, to get our value for rs. Let's get started with finding rs by bringing back our geodesic equation, which I'll write over here. I derived this equation in one of my videos on tensor calculus, so check that out if you haven't already. Recall that p is a free index, which varies from 0 to 3 in this case, and i and j are dummy indices, which are being summed over from 0 to 3. 
So the geodesic equation is really a system of four differential equations, one for each coordinate in our space-time. If you solve these equations, you'll be able to find the paths or the world lines or the geodesics that test particles would take in that particular space-time geometry that's determined by these Christoffel symbols. Now, S, if you remember, is the arc length parameter. This is the form of the geodesic equation that we get if we parameterize our world line with respect to arc length. But if you remember from one of my videos on special relativity, you can write the proper time tau directly in terms of the arc length of a time-like world line via this equation. Of course, we expect any particle to locally follow a time-like world line, so in terms of the arc length, the proper time the particle experiences is directly related to the arc length, aka the space-time interval with an additional factor of c, the speed of light in vacuum in the denominator. Recall also that for a time-like world line, s squared is negative, so tau obviously becomes positive, it's not imaginary. We can then rewrite this expression for tau as the absolute value of s, or the magnitude of s over c. The derivative of tau with respect to s is then just 1 over c, that's because we're only considering positive proper times. So if we use the chain rule, we can write the derivative of some coordinate x super k with respect to s as the derivative of x super k with respect to the proper time tau times the derivative of tau with respect to s. But we know d tau by ds is just 1 over c, so dx super k by ds simplifies to this. When we take the second derivative of x super k with respect to s, we get another factor of d tau by ds. So now the second derivative of x super k in s is its second derivative in tau times 1 over c squared. If we plug these expressions in for the first and second derivatives into our geodesic equation, we get the exact same equation but this time with a factor of 1 over c squared out front, and also now we're differentiating with respect to tau. We can easily cancel out this factor of 1 over c squared and get a more polished geodesic equation, but now in terms of proper time instead of the arc length parameter. So this makes things pretty convenient. Anyway, let's use this geodesic equation in proper time and look at the coordinate corresponding to p equals 1, which in this case is the radial coordinate r, so we basically replace the x super p or the x super 1 by r. If we isolate the second tau derivative in r from the geodesic equation, this is what we have. Let's now recall something else from special relativity, the 4 velocity. By definition, the 4 velocity u is the proper time derivative of the 4 displacement x. So these tau derivatives of x super i and x super j are really just the 4 velocity components of our test particle, so u super i and u super j. You'll recall that the u super 0 component, the time component of the 4 velocity, involves the speed of light c, and the spatial components of u involve the spatial velocity of the particle v, so the u1, u2, and u3. This is now where we start to make our assumptions. We'll assume that the speed of light is very, very large compared to the spatial velocity of our particle. So we're going in the classical Galilean relativity limit instead of the Lorentzian c is a finite number limit. So that means on the right-hand side, the dominant term in the summation of the four velocity components over i and j is u super zero whole squared. Because the spatial velocity of the particle is so small, every other term involving the components u super one, two, or three vanishes in comparison to u super zero whole squared. That means the only Christoffel symbol we need to worry about for our radial acceleration on the left is gamma super one sub zero zero. We can plug in the Christoffel symbol to get the following equation. Now if we substitute 1 over a as b and b prime as negative rs over r squared, this is what we get for our second t derivative in r. Additionally, when c is much larger than the spatial velocity, the proper time tau just becomes the regular time coordinate t, so our geodesic equation in r now gets changed to a second derivative of r with respect to t instead of just tau. Let's now make our second assumption that our gravitational field is weak. What this means is that the metric tensor corresponding to our gravitational field can be approximated as the Minkowski metric plus a small perturbation h from that Minkowski metric. This h is very small compared to eta. So in the weak field limit, the b of r component approximately just becomes 1, meaning that our radial acceleration turns into the following. I'll call this equation 4. Additionally, because we're assuming a weak gravitational field, we can use the physics of Newtonian gravity to write an equation for our acceleration in R. 
from Newton's second law and Newton's law of universal gravitation, the acceleration after canceling out the small mass m of the test particle is just g times capital M over r squared. If I plug this into equation 4, I end up with the following. If I then isolate my r sub s, I find that r sub s is 2gm over c squared, where again capital M is the mass of our massive spherical object generating the Schwarzschild geometry. So finally, after all this hard work, we've derived the Schwarzschild metric, the metric of the four-dimensional space-time surrounding a static, spherically symmetric mass, which I will write here as the following. The constant r sub s, the 2gm over c squared, by the way, has a special name. It's called the Schwarzschild radius. Sometimes you'll see the metric written in the form of the line element ds squared or the space-time interval ds squared, which you use to calculate distances in space-time. The Schwarzschild metric would then be incorporated into this line element as follows. Now this ds squared equation is sometimes also called the Schwarzschild metric, but in reality the metric refers to the metric tensor given by g. The ds squared is the line element. Anyway, that should do it for this video. In the next lesson, we're going to discuss some physics behind the Schwarzschild metric, including the Schwarzschild black hole. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.